but we're going to continue on our journey now, uh, thinking about the, the research focus areas uh, that we're working on here in California. And we're going to turn now to assessing and mitigating chemicals in potable reuse. And for this part of the program, we have with us today Andrew Salveson, a PE and the Water Reuse Practice Leader for Corolla Engineers. Andy ha is a Vice President and Water Reuse Chief Technologist at Corolla Engineers, where he leads advanced technology research and development and oversees Corolla's advanced wastewater treatment design efforts. He leads the planning, permitting, and design of direct and indirect potable reuse facilities around the country, uh, and including projects for the California Direct Potable Reuse Initiative. In addition, he serves on the NWI Independent Advisory Panel for the Development of Potable Reuse Regulations and Guidance in, in New Mexico, as, world, as well as the World Health Organization team to develop international guidelines for direct and indirect potable reuse. Mr. Salveson has a BS in Civil Engineering from San Jose State and an MS in Environmental Engineering Technology and Environmental Technology from the University of California, Davis. He's a registered professional engineer in California. Please welcome Andrew Salveson. Thanks, Kevin. This on? So, uh, uh, no, I'm fine, thank you. Appreciate it. Hi. So, uh, first, a comment to the planning committee. Next time, put me before someone like that. Uh, it's instead of after, uh, very difficult to follow such an engaging and insightful uh, presentation. So, I very much enjoyed that. Uh, my title today is Assessing and Mitigating Chemicals in Potable Water Reuse. And that's a bit of a deceptive title because what I'm really going to talk about today is the role that reverse osmosis plays in purification for potable water reuse and reflecting on better ways, lower energy, non-brine technologies that can create the same high quality potable water supply. So by the time I'm done today, by the way, is there a button somewhere? <laughs> There's, there's this. It's the green one, not the red one? All right. Thank you. Uh, by the time I'm done today, you may think that my title isn't what it was, but it was my love affair with granular activated carbon. <laughs> so I do want to point out uh, a lifelong Californian, and, uh, and I, by speaking out against reverse osmosis, I may have to move. Uh, so we'll keep going here. So start with potable water reuse uh, innovation and progress that we've seen uh, in the industry. And I'm going to go through some firsts because there has been a lot happening in this field that's incredibly exciting and challenging. So got my little foam finger on the top left there. Uh, going out to Texas here, this is the Big Spring facility. First operational direct potable reuse system in the United States. Been running for more than four years successfully. 24 months of extensive testing of that facility told us a lot about the safety in terms of pathogen removal, regulated chemicals, aesthetics, and there was also a whole number of unregulated chemicals that were part of that analysis. My colleague who ran that program, uh, pregnant on the left, and then after the birth of her beautiful daughter, uh, Portia, uh, she liked to make sure everyone saw, and when she was at the site, she would drink the water from that purification process uh, every day, and her child, as she said, came out with just one head. <laughs> so that's, that's Ava. Uh, and there's good stories that we can take from that project, thousands of data points, but one of the things that we continue to look at is relative quality. So on the top left, we show the effluent from the wastewater plant that feeds the purification facility. In the top right, that's the purified water after it's gone through RO. And on the bottom left, that's the water supply that feeds their community. So adding this new water to that community presented them with a step change in the overall water quality that goes to the customers. So let's look at another number one. First permitted direct to distribution, direct potable reuse system in the United States, El Paso, Texas. That facility does have its permit. It has a NWRI expert panel that has also weighed in on the safety of that system. 
and it will be going through purification. It's going to be wastewater in the morning, go through purification, and be new water to the community in the afternoon. So a direct distribution system, that's number one. Uh, and I have quotes around permitting on this one because I know they're still going through their final permitting. But let's go to California, city of San Diego, the first permitted potable reuse surface water augmentation project in the state of California. That was a big leap forward, a large regulatory lift, as they say. A number of people working on that project are in this room today. And a, a monumental effort. And, and you now are going to see a number of potable water reuse projects in California that are considering or implementing surface water augmentation. Uh, some colleagues of mine here that I did not warn they were going to see this slide, uh, some folks from Ventura, first proposed direct potable reuse project in the state of California. So after uh, extensive demonstration testing and uh, a lot of preliminary engineering work, they're now moving forward with that permitting process. So there's a lot of firsts here, and they're exciting. They give us new opportunities for new water. Try again. What do each of these four projects have in common? Reverse osmosis. Photo here from the city of LA's plant. So let's reflect on that. Reverse osmosis does a great job. It gives us confidence in the water quality. It does come at a high cost to construct. It comes at a high energy usage rate. And it creates a concentrate, which must be dealt with. So what does RO do best? Other than salt removal, obviously, if you need salt removal, something like RO is, has to be part of your solution. But a lot of communities in this country cannot discharge an RO concentrate and do not need to remove salt from their water. So what does it do? It removes pathogens very well. So some data here from Ventura. In this real simple example, six log removal of virus through some testing that was done at the site. So that's great. What else does it do? Removes TOC. So in this example from Los Angeles, TOC is over seven milligrams per liter coming into the RO, and afterwards it's 0.1. That's great. We like the removal of TOC because there's a bunch of stuff in there, we're really not sure what it is. It gives us that high TOC removal, provides confidence to removal of some of the unknowns, some of the CECs, chemicals or constituents of emerging concern we talk about, hormones, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. So this is data from the Santa Clara Valley Water District on the left, San, uh, secondary effluent where a lot of these chemicals are detected in the secondary effluent and they're detected at reasonably high levels. And then on the right, after it goes through purification, very few chemicals are found and the ones that are found are at nanogram per liter levels typically. So that high degree of TOC removal in our minds translates to a high degree of confidence in all the other water quality stuff that we are concerned about or are undefined. So, what if we could not use RO for direct potable reuse? How would we be confident in chemical water quality? Now, if you put a pair of glasses on this guy, yes, we do look similar. <laughs> I'm regressing at the top here, and I'll soon be caught up to that fellow. But this is a primary question we face, and we face it here in California as well. So I'm now going to go east to Altamont Springs, Florida. I want to point out a few things. First, where is Altamont Springs, Florida? It's outside of Orlando. I also want to take a little pride in their award that they received this year from Water Reuse, Innovative Project of the Year for their Pure Alta project. And I want to provide thank you to some of the folks. I know there's at least one of, the, uh, one of our teammates on this project in the room. Uh, the Trussell Technologies folks were uh, very useful on, on this project, as well as a number of other folks which I haven't seen here today. So let's talk about Pure Alta. It was a, is a permanent, full-scale, direct potable reuse demonstration facility. It has now been rigorously tested for 12 months 
continuously. It takes secondary filtered effluent and it runs it through ozone oxidation. It then runs it through biofiltration using granular activated carbon. Then it goes through ultrafiltration, low pressure membranes. Granular activated carbon again and UV advanced oxidation. So let's remember again, RO removes pathogens, chemical, pollutants, and yes, salt. And we're going to ignore the salt part for the rest of this discussion. So I am supposed to be talking about chemicals, and I promise you I will get to that. But let's talk about pathogens for a moment, because it was very properly pointed out how important pathogen removal is to potable water reuse. That was done earlier today in several presentations. And that is our primary focus. So we did, as part of that project, a number of pathogen studies, sampling, analysis, Giardia, crypto, different types of virus, culturable, gene copy work, you name it. And we defined our pathogen levels in the feed to the purification system, shown in the, some of the data shown on the bottom left. And then we implemented the 1 in 10,000 risk, which you learn something new every day. Uh, and uh, listening to <laughs> Chuck's presentation last night, was eye-opening for me is how we got to 1 in 10,000. Very similar to some of the California regulations on chlorination, I believe. It was, oh, that looks good. So as part of the work in Altamont Springs, we did extensive virus and Giardia and crypto work. We looked at how each of these processes removes the different pathogens, but we didn't do it when it was new. We waited a year. And we didn't fix anything for the whole year. And we wanted to see how now does the system perform. And we started doing our pathogen studies and we seeded pathogens in and et cetera. And when you end up and you do the math at the end of the day, the processes we employed that were shown on those previous slides got us over our targeted standards. Over 12 log virus, over 10 log Giardia, over 10 log crypto. We've heard talks about QMRA as part of a research grant done with several folks here, uh, Jeff Soller and the Trussells. We did some risk assessment work on this treatment train as part of that grant. And we showed that even with failed system components, off spec water, we were able to meet our one in 10,000 targets. So that QMRA is a critical tool for looking at these alternative treatment systems. So let's talk about carbon now. Remember I said that reverse osmosis can take you from 7 down to 0.1 or 0.2 milligrams per liter. Well, this is what pure, the Pure Alta system did. This is what the ozone biofiltration type process can do, and it's a lot different. So let's look at the far left, and the secondary filtered effluent, the TOC, is 6 milligrams per liter, about. The ozone's about the same. It goes through ozonation, doesn't really change the TOC. We're not mineralizing anything with that ozone. And then we start knocking down that TOC, six down to four and a half. And then the ultrafilter gets a, just a little bit better. And then we hit it with carbon again and gets it down below three. Now, when the carbon is new, we're down to two. And when the carbon gets loaded up, it starts getting up to three. And so then you say to yourself, all right, you just showed me on the RO, I get down to 0.1. And now I've got three, and three is a lot more than 0.1. So is there an impact on that? Is there a potential health impact from that total organic carbon? And that's what we're looking at as part of this project. So let's start with your conventional CECs, hormones, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. Working with Eric Dickinson at Southern Nevada Water Authority, a fantastic partner on this project. And this is just one snapshot of a lot of data, but let's go from top to bottom. First of all, we looked at, in this case, 13 different CECs. And you can see in the secondary filtered effluent as we moved down, we found nine, and they were at high levels. And then we ozonated it in this t particular case, and then we found eight, and at lower levels. And then biofiltration, six. Ultrafiltration, five. GAC, three. 
and after the final UV advanced oxidation process, UV AOP, we're down to one. And extremely low levels. So now let's break it down as we did before on that RO example I showed you. So on the left, we've got 69% detected CECs and at reasonably high levels. And on the right, we have only 8% detected. And what we find is that extremely low nanogram per liter levels. If I was to put the pie charts up here side by side, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So now we start breaking down these chemicals and we say, where is this removal happening? How do these processes work together? And an interesting sidebar on this is that that second carbon unit, we added it on. We didn't really think it was going to be that critical. Uh, but it turns out it is one of the most important polishing processes we could have for this system. So this is uh, meprobamate, one of the CECs. You can see that the ozone and biofiltration together do a good job of removing it. But where is that last big chunk done? Carbon. Flame retardants, TCEP. Ozone doesn't do much, or if anything, biofiltration does a nice job for us. Carbon. There's a theme here. Sulfamethoxazole. Oh, there's ozone. It got it. So there's nothing left. Sulfamethoxazole is an antibiotic. Uh, Floxetine. Again, ozone takes care of business. Sucralose. Anyone have some of that today? Who gets to take care of the sucralose? The carbon. And this isn't just when the carbon's new. This is after the system has been running for many bed volumes. And a lot of the sites have already been filled. And it starts acting actually as a second biofiltration system. So I just showed you the CECs, but when you go in front of a skeptical public, They'll say, well, you tested for 13 things, Andy. I said, well, no, we, we all did this. No, 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 you didn't do everything. You, and, th and they'll name things that don't have analytical methods. They'll make up chemical formulas. <laughs> and me, being a civil engineer from San Jose State and UC Davis, I don't know if my professor George is here. We, I wasn't really very good at chemistry. So anyway, so what about the unknowns? That's our next frontier trying to answer this question on that three milligram per liter of TOC. So, one of our new tools, one of our shiny new baubles are bioassays. And one method to use them is to start to tackle these unknowns. So, we partnered with an old friend of mine, uh, Mike Dennison, he was one of my graduate advisors way back in the day. And we looked at these groups, estrogen-like chemicals, uh, glucocorticoids, I'm going to stop being able to pronounce some of these, uh, androgen, dioxin, genotoxicity, cytotoxicity. Toxicity. And envision these like uh, large umbrellas covering a lot of different chemicals that could be potentially be in the water. And we are not capturing everything with these bioassays, but we are doing a better job than just running 13 tests for CECs. Trying to answer that three milligram per liter TOC question. So I'm gonna show you some of our results, which we're very, very excited about. So this test, is for human estrogen receptor alpha responsive bioassay for detection of estrogenic chemicals. It says it on the bottom. And wh what I want to point out is, first of all, we ran these tests repeatedly over the year-long um, demonstration. If you look at the far left, you have your control. And to me, that's where we want to get back to. And if you go then left to right, you see that the secondary filtered effluent is getting a response. That doesn't mean the response is a detrimental health response, but it means there's something in the water that's causing that response. And now as we go from left to right, just like you did with the CECs, as they got reduced through the processes, you see that again here. And you see the value of that granular activated carbon 
come into play again. Next, a different test for estrogenic, estrogenic chemicals. And again, the secondary affluent lights up. The biofilter, it's lower. And as we go through GAC and UV AOP, there's further reduction. Let's go to the next one, androgen chemicals. It's the same story. These things, these bioassays are able to tell us that there are chemicals with some properties in the secondary filtered effluent. No surprise, because I just showed you there's CECs in secondary effluent. But that we're able to, just like the CECs, remove them through the purification processes. Keep going. Glucocorticoid, progesterone-like chemicals. Again, a different test for progesterone-like progesterone -like chemicals. And dioxin-like chemicals in this example. So we are providing ourselves a lot more confidence in the water quality through this non-RO process. So I'm wrapping up. A short summary. So potable water reuse, and you've heard this today, uh, requires multiple barriers for reliable purification. And those barriers may be reverse osmosis. So this table here shows the protozoa, virus, regulated chemicals, and CECs that we all want to reduce or get rid of entirely in these waters. And you can see that the wastewater treatment plant has a significant role in removing those four different groups. Ultrafiltration does a little bit there. It's nice on the protozoa. Reverse osmosis is a big hammer. And the UV advanced oxidation is a good polishing process. And this is proven, and we're very comfortable with this. That's why reverse osmosis in California is by far the preferred uh, technology for these new purification projects. We also happen to have a large ocean for the brine. So as we look to other locations, and as we consider lower cost, lower energy solutions, we can put together other treatment processes, as shown on the bottom, that end up having more barriers to the different chemicals and pathogens that we are targeting and providing that high quality water. The other thing not discussed here, but is very important for any of these purification systems, and this is a snapshot from the ways of water done by Linda McPherson, talks about the, the need for precise and accurate online monitoring for water quality confidence. So for each of these things that we're relying upon so heavily, we've got to have those meters that can tell us what's really happening in real time, and especially when we're dealing with direct potable reuse. So I would like to point out several things. On the photo on the left, that's Nate. He ran and is running the treatment, the demonstration facility in Altamont Springs, Florida. If you missed my, one of my first slides, I want to point out again, this project got an incredible award. And there's the award. And I'd be glad to open it up for questions if we have time. Andy, you ready for some questions? Okay, take it away. We're going to bring the microphone over. There we go. Take it away. Hi. Um, if we have a direct potable reuse and we're recycling the water, the salts are going to build up and you're going to have a acidic problem because people don't like to taste, have a great tasty water. So how are you addressing that? Right. Yeah, so, so the buildup of salts in a system is, is absolutely, a, could, can be a concern depending on what your other water supplies are, what percentage of water is going through recirculation. Uh, and that's, that's, I think that in itself is it's a new, a, an important area for further investigation. It's not something that's been addressed yet for this Altamont Springs project as an example. So it's a, it's a good point. You have uh, two GAC reactors in series, uh, in, separated by the UF unit. Could you have had just one uh, GAC, uh, that first biofilter, and just increase the empty bed contact time and gotten the same results? Potentially, yes. Yes. I, we have done profiling on the biofiltration system. 
And, uh, and, but by combining it like that, which could have economic benefit, you limit your flexibility to, if you decide to operate the GAC as a GAC contactor, you limit your ability to make those modifications. Yeah, yeah. so it's, so having the two in series uh, gives you more flexibility. Right, so, so right now, this one particular utility, is its intent is to change out the carbon as it exhausts, uh, even though we showed that, this, that as a secondary biofilter, it could be valuable. Yeah. Uh, just a comment, I think a lot of our GAC biofilters have been uh, just rather arbitrarily designed for 10 or 15 minute empty bed contact time. And uh, it's, I think that uh, using that empty bed contact time as a variable, uh, we could get uh, much better uh, biological removal in a lot of cases. I think the optimization of biofiltration on the wastewater side, there's a large research area that's still needed. And I'm curious about uh, how much bromate you generated. What was the <laughs> zero? <laughs> it was very little. <laughs> Go ahead, please. So what was the ozone dose, CT, yes. all those things? If you elaborate a little bit, yes. I appreciate it. Yes. So. Absolutely important, and we were on pins and needles when we started the project, because if we ozonate wastewater and we had bromide, reasonably, we had a reasonably high amount of bromide. If we ozonate it, you expect to make bromate. You also make NDMA with ozonization of wastewater. Uh, the system is run in a sub-residual mode. So we're running, uh, so what we found is that if we control the ozone dose based upon the feed TOC at the right ratios and below, then we don't make very much bromate, it was low levels, and we don't make very much NDMA. Now the NDMA is then handled by the biofiltration, but the bromate wouldn't be. So, so we have to keep, we're keeping our ozone dose at a sub-residual. We've proven that it still kills virus at that sub-residual, but we can't go too low because then the virus kill drops off. So we're so we're running at about a 0.8 ozone to TOC ratio on the control system. And we found we can actually go up a little over one, but that's when you start getting into trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Eric, take it away. Salt. Uh, let's come back to the salt. Uh, as was mentioned, for a, uh, in a DPR scenario, it might build up over time. Um, but I'd also caution that as folks are getting better, communities are getting better about conservation, um, the plant today that may not need that RO for, for salt removal could very well in the near future uh, need that same salt removal portion out of their uh, recycle facility. So right. I think there's a double-edged sword with conservation. Um, we look at conservation and water recycling as the panacea for all of our water problems, or at least some uh, parts of our communities do. But the reality is that they, they do have conflicting um, results, right? Because the better you are at conservation, the tougher it is to recycle whatever water is left in your, in your uh, wastewater treatment system. Right. So in this uh, scenario, Andy, how close to the drinking water standards for, for TDS was, was the, uh, the effluent. Yeah, so, there, so this facility runs, I believe, between 200 and 300 milligrams per liter on TDS. And, and it's, a, it's a great point, made also by Perry, uh, that, that if you have a high percentage in this continuous loop, you're gonna run into a, the math's pretty easy to do. And, and so you very well could be looking at a side stream RO or nanofilter that's going to peel off that salt and you're going to want to hyper concentrate it and then you're but you're, you're looking at for these inland communities trucking that water uh, that 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 brine so but it, it very well may be necessary as we move forward in the industry with this kind of concepts is those side streams to have a salt vent or a uh, pressure relief valve if you could say in on that thanks yeah. thank you Annie thanks.